question uh, of this uh, afternoon. And uh, the topic that will be discussed during this session is the mechanisms, landslide mechanism, and other complex and relevant topics for landslides to understand the landslide, the triggering, landslide evolution, and so on. And during this session, we uh, have four presentations. The first two presentations are devoted to introduce and discuss uh, case study, respectively in Cyprus and Caucasus, Russia. And the third presentation will focus on site laboratory investigation. And the last one is uh, devoted to the friction angle mobilized by shallow earth flow. This presentation will be delivered by Konstantinos uh, uh, Lupasakis, professor at the National Technical University of Athens, Daria Shubina or Shubina, sorry, uh, I, I don't know the perfect pronounce, and uh, Russian State University for Geological uh, Prospecting. And the third one will be delivered by Paolo Zimmaro coming from the UCLA University and now at the University of Calabria, Southern Italy, Cosenza. And the last one will be delivered by Luca Comegna, professor at the University, at the University uh, of the Campania region, Luigi Vanvitello. Uh, each presentation will be long uh, 15 uh, minutes. And uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, the discussion will be governed by Biliana Abomalsov, uh, University of Beograd, the Faculty of Mining and Geology. So please, Constantino uh, Lupasakis, the microphone is yours. Please deliver your presentation. Sardino su di, di audio, di sound, okay, okay. doesn't work. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 okay, thank you, Professor Cassini. We're going to discuss about the Limnes landslide in Pisuri, Cyprus. Actually, this must be the largest uh, active landslide at the moment in Cyprus. It's a very interesting uh, case study. That's why I selected to present it to you. Uh, Pisuri is located in uh, Lemesos district. It's uh, uh, 30 kilometers west of uh, Lemesos and uh, 30 kilometers east of uh, Paphos. So it's in the middle of uh, two uh, big, big cities of uh, Cyprus. Uh, the area affected uh, by the large slide is the one indicated in this uh, slide. It's approximately, approximately 500,000 uh, square meters. It's a, a very big large slide uh, and uh, we can identify more than 500 uh, property, pro pro properties on top of this uh, uh, large slides. We can see apartments, buildings, uh, 500 uh, of them. Uh, um, it was activated during winter 2011-2012 uh, after a period of prolonged high precipitation. And actually it uh, came out that uh, this large slide reactivated practically an old uh, prehistoric landslide. As you can see here, there is a C-shaped uh, slope uh, indicated the location of the old uh, scarp, of the old uh, uh, main scarp of uh, the landslide, prehistoric landslide. Here you can see some uh, images indicated the, the, the damages recorded on site. You can see damages on the uh, road network uh, houses. Uh, a three-story building. Uh, so let's uh, say a few words about the geological setting of the site. According to Stowe et al, uh, 15 lithostratigraphic units can be identified at the wider region, uh, six within the Pleiopleistocene succession, two within the Messinian evaporites, and seven units within the eocene miocene limestone successions. Uh, those units can be further divided in uh, several subunits. And here you can see the geological map of the wider area. The large slide is somewhere here. Um, now, if we examine the 
geological setting of uh, the large slide itself, we can see that uh, the large slide uh, occurred in the Pissouri Marl. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, formation, exhibiting serious geotechnical problems due to its high uh, content of uh, clay materials. Uh, the Pissouri Marls can be distinguished in three horizons, the lower, the middle, and the upper horizon and actually with some uh, uh, characteristics for each one. And uh, actually the sliding mass consists of, uh, of the upper horizon of the Pissouri Marl, and it's, uh, 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 it's uh, formed by equally by alternating marls and siltstones. Here we can see a picture of uh, this uh, marl. Uh, what's really important to notice is that uh, uh, numerous slick insights have been recorded at the geotechnical borehole logs uh, down to depths of 39 meters. So we have a, an old large slide reactivated and uh, yeah, approximately 40 meters uh, of uh, the marl formation uh, uh, presented there can be uh, identified as a, a extremely uh, remolded or uh, uh, shared uh, layers. Uh, I, of course, as you can understand, those uh, the, the upper layer, the upper 40 meters of the study area, uh, have very low uh, shear strength due to the slick inside and all that the disturbance that we can identify there. Now, let's uh, say a few things about the geometrical characteristics of the large slides. In order to estimate the geometry of the failure, we use data coming from inclinometers. Uh, we recorded, we uh, visited the site and we recorded the spatial distribution of the surface ruptures. And also uh, we evaluated data coming from uh, uh, DINSAR uh, data, differential uh, synthetic aperture rate of data. Uh, the inclinometer data uh, uh, were coming from inclinometers distorted by the Cyprus Geotechnic Geological Survey Department. And we noticed that uh, uh, the inclinometers that they are located close to the flanks of the sliding mass, uh, the depth of the failure surface ranges from depths of six to 19 meters. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the inclinometers that they are located close to the axis of the failure uh, have been identified not to go beneath the failure surface, although extending down to depths of 28 meters. So we have a very uh, deep-seated uh, failure. Here we can see some uh, uh, graphs from the inclinometers that's close to the flanks. You can see the depth is approximately 13 meters. Uh, this one is uh, along the axis, 23 meters. And this one also along the axis of the failure. Uh, it's in, uh, the entire inclinometer is inside the moving mass. So we cannot see where is the, the failure plane. Now let's check the spatial distribution of the surface ruptures. That's a very interesting slide. We can see that uh, uh, practically the old large slides has, have been reactivated because as you can see, the surface ruptures extend all around the old uh, failure. Uh, most of the surface ruptures are identified, uh, appear to be concentrated at the upper, uh, at the upper here, at the Western part of the sliding mass. This is the depletion zone of the failure. And the lower, the eastern part of uh, uh, the, um, the mass uh, seems to be less affected by uh, the movement. Uh, that's reasonable because that's the accumulation zone. Uh, newly developed uh, cracks have been identified along the crown of the failure. Here you can see some of those failures. That, that's very interesting to note because uh, that means that we have a gradual progressiveness of the failure uh, west, uh, westwards. So that means that the, the uh, large slide tends to extend uh, further. Also, uh, another interesting finding is that uh, uh, inside the, the depletion zone mainly, uh, we identified some shallow rotational uh, movements uh, inside the mass of the, the sliding uh, of the large slide. So we have a complex phenomenon because we have also some uh, shallow movements on top of the moving mass. mass. Uh, here you can see uh, 
an example of that. We can see here the uh, scarp of the large slide, and here is the foot of a shallow large slide inside the mass of the big large slide. You can see here the um, uh, the scarp. You can see the movements of uh, the head of the large slide, and on the foot of the large slide, you can see that the the building uh, tilts back backwards. So we have a small rotational slide inside the mass, as I told before. Also here we can see uh, how we, re we recorded the, the cracks, the failures along the crest of uh, the large slide. You can see some uh, uh, damage, some cracks initi initiated there. Now let's see what uh, we got from the DIMSAR data. Uh, those uh, uh, information are coming from a report provided by NPA Satellite Mapping uh, CGG Geo Consulting. Uh, here you can see the distribution of the horizontal displacements. As you can see, the entire mass tends to move uh, eastwards. Uh, uh, if we check the vertical displacements, we can see a very uh, interesting uh, uh, agreement between the spatial distribution of the cracks and the deformation. We can see that the, the depletion zone here, the polygons C and D uh, indicate the depletion zone, appear to subside, while the accumulation zone presents an uplift. The red color indicates subsidence, and uh, the blue color indicates uplift. So the depletion uh, zone uh, subsides, and the accumulation zone uplifts. The extent of the movements cover the entire uh, old uh, sliding mass. And uh, also, deformations have been uh, recorded uh, at the crest of the failure. That's the polygon B here. You can see the deformations recorded at the crest. And uh, as I told before, uh, those deformations are in perfect agreement with the distribution of the surface ruptures. Now, let's see the simulation of the failure mechanism. We simulated cross sections extending from the foot of the failure up to the crest. Here you can see a typical cross section extending from the foot up to the crest. And uh, in, in order to uh, simplify the geological structure, we introduced three different formations. We have the disturbed by the that slide Pissouri marl, the undisturbed Pissouri marl, and the Cal Calabasos marls. Uh, those formations can be uh, seen here. We can see the undisturbed marl, it's the green color here. Here is the, the uh, this color is the, the um, um, old last slide mass, and the, the blue one represents the Calabasos marl that it's uh, underneath the uh, Pissouri marl. Uh, now, sorry. Uh, uh, in order to estimate the geotechnical parameters of the uh, formations, we evaluated geotechnical data coming from several studies. And uh, at the end, we applied, we, we, the simulations was applied by using uh, two sets of uh, parameters, one with the maximum possible values and one with the minimum. So we, we uh, did some simulations taking uh, under consideration all the possible variations of the mechanical parameters in order to be uh, precise. Also, we introduced interfaces uh, uh, at the places that we saw uh, that we have slink insides. Uh, we added the external loads. Here you can see the external loads that we have added representing the buildings. And also we introduced uh, an overhanging uh, groundwater aquifer uh, inside the sliding mass. So we tried to represent uh, uh, we have tried to represent the geological conditions and the external loading as uh, um, the best way we could. Now, let's see the simulation results. The sliding mechanism provided by the simulation is in a very good and in perfect agreement with the uh, geometrical characteristics of the uh, large slide. Uh, the maximum displacements have been identified to be at the, at the center of the sliding mass, exactly as uh, they were identified by the uh, the INSAR data, we can see that the maximum displacements can be identified here at the center of the mass. We uh, also uh, saw the shallow 
uh, rotational slides taking place inside the mass. Uh, we uh, saw the uh, foot of the LAT slide to be uplifted, and those are the rotational slides inside the depletion zone. Uh, regarding the, the safety factor values, uh, the factor values, safety factor values were uh, fluctuating from 1.25 when applying the maximum uh, mechanical parameter set and uh, 1.03 when applying the minimum set. Uh, when we removed the water from the sliding mass, the safety factor increased uh, to 1.8 and 1.5 respectively. So it's clear that uh, when we dry the sliding mass, uh, we have uh, better conditions. And that means that we can for sure slow down the movement or even stop them if uh, possible. It's a, it's a very big large slide. So you can understand that it's uh, uh, difficult to be uh, precise if you don't uh, have some uh, uh, indications from site measurements. Uh, also, the failure mechanism produced for the slot formed by the main scarp is in agreement with the deformations recorded uh, at the DIMSAR data. You can see here that uh, uh, the scarp tends to fail the way it's, it was uh, recorded in the INSAR data. And uh, uh, as you saw, we have already recorded some surface ruptures over the crest. Now, uh, the conclusions uh, that we can uh, uh, summarize, the large slide presents a really complex mechanism successfully uh, simulated and uh, investigated uh, by the uh, geological, geotechnical and hydrogeological data. Uh, the reactivated large slide is a deep-seated failure with uh, reaching down to depths larger than 28 meters. It's a transitional failure uh, and it's clearly defined, uh, a, a depletion zone is clearly defined, subjected to subsiding deformations. And the accumulation zone also can be uh, defined at the foot of the failure, subjected to uplifted, uplifting deformation. Besides the above described movements of the last slide, beside the sliding mass, secondary shallow rotational failures can be identified, given an additional complexity to the overall failure. A crucial finding was the fact that the uh, slope uh, formed by the scarp uh, tends to move, and uh, we have a, a progressiveness uh, uh, in our failure. It seems to be a, a very dangerous situation. It has to be examined thoroughly. And uh, uh, the application of draining measures can be proved uh, as an effective technique for the termination or the uh, deceleration of the movements. Uh, it's clear that when we remove the water, the safety factors increase up to 40%. Uh, before uh, closing my presentation, I would like to take the chance and invite you uh, at the third European Regional Conference of the International Association that it's uh, going to take place uh, in Athens uh, next October. So we hope to see you all there. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lupasakis, for uh, your interesting presentation, dealing with uh, a, an interesting uh, landslide affecti affecting a densely urbanized uh, area. Thank you. Uh, I am convinced that, that uh, you will get a uh, question at the end of this session. Now it's time for the presentation of Daria Shubina uh, that uh, work at the Russian State University. And her presentation deals with the second case study uh, and particularly a landslide affecting an area in Caucasus, Russia. Please, Daria. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me start with uh, saying special hello to Miss Albumasov. Здравствуйте. 
And uh, now let me tell you about our work. Uh, we represented together with uh, our colleagues from Moscow State University and uh, Russian State University for Geological Prospecting. And the name of our work is the stability assessment of the landslide, which is called Kabardinka. Uh, and it is it occurred in carbonate erogenous flish in on the Western Caucasus in Russia. So the region of Western Caucasus is situated in the south part of Russia and it's a uh, high uh, mountain regions region and um, the main causes of landslides in this region are uh, real life and also seismic activity. Uh, landslides affect about 50% uh, up to 75% of the area. Uh, typical geological section uh, is originous and carbonate flish. Uh, it is represented by claystones, siltstones, sandstones and limestones. It is folded and uh, form some kind of uh, a ridge uh, and the Kabardinka landslide, which I want to talk about, is uh, situated near the city of Novorossiysk uh, on the Marhot ridge. There are two main, main types of landslides which are typical for this region. The first type is superficial earth flows and the second one is uh, big block rock slides and they um, involve up to 30 meters thick uh, rocks in the movements. And uh, there is a special group, a uh, series of landslides, which are represented by uh, large scale seismically induced landslides. Uh, their last activity dates about 2000 years uh, and uh, they measured by, they can be measured by a uh, million cubic meters. The Kabardinka landslide is situated on the southwest slope of, of the Marcot Ridge and the length of this slope is about one kilometer and the height is about 250. Uh, during the root observations, the fracturing system uh, characteristics were measured and also some faults were founded. Uh, you can see the typical cross section on the pictures. The characteristics of fracturing systems you can see on the table and uh, you also can see a uh, scarp. Uh, the volume of this complex landslide is uh, evaluated at least about 3.5 million cubic meters. Slope stability assessment were made in two stages. Firstly, uh, it was performed with a standard limit, limit equilibrium methods and the safety factor was found to be more than 2.4. Such safety factor uh, doesn't match real situation because the signs of landslide activity were found during the root observations. Uh, thus, the modeling results do not match. Uh, so, uh, then the alternative quantitative stability assessments was performed using the three-dimensional block analytical method. Uh, it includes two stages. The first stages uh, was um, made to, um, to get the information about what shape does the landslide body have. Uh, in the first stage, the kinematic analysis uh, showed us that the landslide can be formed in the wedge type. So on the second stage, the safety factor was calculated and uh, using the following properties, uh, the cohesion about 30 and uh, internal friction about 24 degrees, the safety factor results to be uh, close to one. So uh, it characterizes uh, that the slope is close to stable state, but can be uh, active 
for example, under some extreme conditions for uh, abnormal heavy precipitation or maybe se seismic activity. And we can make two main conclusions from this work. The first one is that for the region of Western Caucasus where fleece uh, is widely spread, uh, you can uh, find um, specific forms of landslide activity, for example, planar or wedge type blocks, landslide blocks. And uh, in this case, landslide hazard analysis should be made uh, using the 3D analysis. And you should uh, also take uh, under consideration the whole set of discontinuities and fracturing systems to perform the assessment correctly. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Daria, for your nice presentation. Uh, probably during the discussion, uh, you will have the opportunity to deepen some aspects uh, of the landslides uh, uh, you have shown to us. And now we, we, we uh, pass from Caucasus to Southern Italy. And the microphone is for Paolo Zimmaro, uh, who is working uh, uh, presently at the University of Calabria Unical. Uh, please, Dr. Zimmaro. All right, thank you so much to the chairman, Professor Cascini, for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today and present a piece of research I worked on with Professor Auxilio from the University of Calabria entitled Site Laboratory Investigation Strategies to Characterize a Complex Slope Instability Phenomenon in Southern Italy. Uh, as Professor Cascini said, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calabria, but I'm also a visiting researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles. Now, here is the, the outline of today's presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about some geologic and tectonic background of the Gimigliano area in Calabria, southern Italy, because the main goal today is to perform uh, laboratory site characterization of a complex instability that took place in Gimigliano. So we're going to talk about the Gimigliano landslide, and I'm going to provide you with some details about it. And then we're going to talk about some data we collected before 2010, when there was a reactivation of that landslide. So we're going to focus on some pre-2010 monitoring data. We'll then talk uh, very uh, in depth about a post-2010 geotechnical test program and monitoring that we performed as part of this study. Uh, I'm going to describe you some field geotechnical and geophysical investigation data, laboratory tests in the geotechnical lab, as well as uh, using laboratory ultrasonic testing, and then some geotechnical and structural monitoring. All of these will be um, finalized to a multi-technique based model of the Gimigliano landslide that I'm gonna show you uh, lies in a very, very complex geologic and tectonic environment. And then I will uh, try to draw some take home remarks. So Gimigliano is located um, in Calabria, Italy, as you can see here. Uh, we're talking about the toe of the booth uh, in our uh, beautiful peninsula, and we are in the middle of the Calabria region. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the area we're going to analyze, which is the Gimigliano area. For those of you who followed today's presentation this morning by Professor Doyoni, we are in the middle of the Calabrian Arc subduction zone. So we are right there where there's the interface between uh, the African plate and the uh, European, Euro, Euro, European Asian plate. Here, uh, I'm showing you a geology map with some tectonic features uh, in it. Uh, Gimiano is located here, is this red dot you can see in the center of the figure. Then we have three main seismogenic fault traces. These are not individual faults, rather composite features that are uh, the most active uh, in the area. Uh, namely the Crati Valley to the northwest of Gimigliano, the Lakes Fault to the northeast, and the Lamezia Catanzaro's Strike Slips Fault, which is very important for Gimigliano, uh, as I'm going to show you in a moment. 
uh, as a result of a very active tectonic, we have a very complex geology. Uh, in this map, Jimiano lies on a serpentinites area. Then we have granites uh, here and there. And then we have a big portion of filities and gneisses that are uh, also, uh, uh, also present along with some sandstones. So you can see here, uh, I'm starting to provide you with a very complex, even chaotic geologic uh, setting as a result of a very active tectonic area. And this is also testified by this uh, slide, which is taken from Tansi et al. 2007. They studied active tectonic of the area uh, here is Gimigliano, and as you can see, there is a big fault, the so-called Amantea Gimigliano fault, that goes right through the city of Gimigliano and makes the complexity of the picture I just showed you even more uh, interesting. Uh, and this is a zoom in on that map, also from Tansi et al. 2007, where you can see that there are two areas uh, right uh, south of the Amantea Gimigliano fault and north of the La Mezia um, of the La Mezia Catanzaro Fault, there are two areas, Gimigliano Inferiore, the lower part, and Gimigliano Superiore, the upper part. And as you can see from this cross section, we are here in a very active area with a very complex geology and tectonic area. So this is a, a photo of the area we are analyzing. You can see there are two main zones that we can identify. In purple, the new building estate uh, in the upper Gimigliano area, and then always on in the upper Gimigliano area, the medieval village. Uh, just for reference, there is lower Gimigliano here uh, at the lower uh, left corner of this photo. And then there is a river, the so-called Corace River, that goes south and then goes up north here. And then there is a big bridge, which I'm going to go back to uh, in a moment. So this is a 3D reconstruction of the area using digital elevation, elevation model data. Uh, we still have the new building estate with the purple arrow and the medieval village with the yellow area uh, arrow. And then, you know, south on the uh, left-hand uh, corner at the bottom of the figure, we still have the Corace River just for you to have a reference. And so you can see that uh, the complexity of the geology also has an addition to the complexity of the topography here, uh, where we have this terrace of the medieval village and then uh, this slope where the new building estate is located. And so this is a landslide inventory map prepared by the Calabria region, uh, the so-called PAI 2016, where you can see uh, the medieval village here and the new building estate. As you can see, there are numerous landslides within the new building estate and what we call the Gimigliano landslide encompass the entire area of the new building estate here. I'm going to show you later some additional details, but this is a broad area where we have uh, potential for landslides that are already mapped. The, new, the medieval village, on the other hand, is not influenced by any mapped landslide, which is going to be confirmed later by using monitoring data. So this is a sketch of a cross section of the upper Gimigliano area. Uh, the Corace River is here. Here is the town of Gimigliano for reference. As you can see here, we have a detrital colluvial deposit at the center uh, with a pretty uh, big depth at the center of the town. And then this is uh, on top of a Frido unit, which is com comprises metamorphic ophiolitic rocks and philatic schists. And then north and south of the town of Gimigliano, all the way to the Corace River area, we have an intensely uh, tectonized and complex, even chaotic geologic setting that is uh, uh, you know, shown in this sketch. So first of all, we took pre-2010 monitoring data from Fortunato and Ferrucci 2012. On the left-hand side panel, you see uh, line of sight, persistent cutter, uh, in interferometric uh, synthetic aperture, radar data, which is multi-epoch radar data from the satellite tracking displacements along the line of sight of the satellite, you can see that the, most of the uh, sub-vertical displacement takes place in the new building estate. Uh, there is almost no displacements going on uh, for this period in the medieval village. Uh, this is the new building estate location. Uh, the picture is a little different on the right-hand side panel. 
where we have a 2002-2010 map uh, showing where the new the medieval village is located. There are some displacements on its western portion, but the most displacements is still uh, on the uh, new building estate. So from this monitoring data, we calibrated our geotechnical investigation, knowing that the new building estate uh, has higher velocities in terms of uh, displacements. And so in 2010, there was a huge reactivation of the landslide during winter. This is uh, some dramatic damage at the bridge on the Coracha River I showed you earlier. Then we have some, this, some damage to retaining structures in the new building estate. Uh, here in the upper part, here in the lower part, so there's also some structural damage. This is an urbanized area, so you can imagine that all of this damage had a strong impact on the community. And so this is a map where I, I'm showing you where we decided to uh, drill four borings, S1, S2, and S3, and S4, uh, almost all of which are located within the new, the new building estate. S1 is in a tr transitional area uh, in the northern part, and we decided to go very deep to try and capture uh, all possible displacements going on at that. And so this is uh, the geotechnical field investigation data from Boring S1. As you can see here, we have an inclinometer uh, from which we made some measurements. We also have boring log, some photos from the boring log in the area where uh, we found most displacements around 15 meters of depth. We also took samples and performed some pressure meter uh, tests uh, unfortunately, because of time constraints, I'm not able to show you all of the results, but the paper uh, discusses all of the data, and I think this can be an interesting case study also uh, for other applications. Uh, this is S2, probably the most interesting boring along with S3, where you can see that there is a strong displacement in a narrow shear band around 60 meters of depth uh, within a very thin black filitis material. Uh, the same story can be said by looking at boring S3, where we have these very thin uh, sericitic filities and quartzite very, and quartzites very altered at the depth of 47 meters along the same cross section. So this data was very precious in the characterization of the, of the area. And then we have S4, uh, which is still along the same cross section and provides us with some more or less the same information we gathered from S2 and S3. Uh, we placed uh, many piezometers within S1, S2, and S3. Uh, we analyzed them for quite a long time. We also performed some slug tests to characterize um, the um, uh, hydraulic conductivity of these materials, and all of the results are presented here. We place the three piezometers within each boring uh, to capture uh, all of the details we wanted about the fluctuation of the water table. And so we also used some structural monitoring data, which is always a great source of information from, uh, for ongoing landslides from the local civil protection. Here I have a joint between uh, a column and a beam uh, in 2013, and then the evolution over time in 2014, 17, 18. As you can see, the landslide after reactivation moved, and this is actually uh, consistent with all of the monitoring data I showed you. Then we uh, took a look uh, at data provided by Rizzo and all 2012 about electrical resistivity tomographies performed on several longitudinal sections. And most interestingly, along the same cross section we analyzed with geotechnical investigation. So let's take a look to that electrical resistivity tomography along the cross section we are analyzing. Uh, here, as you can see, it seems like there are some areas where discontinuities may be potentially present. Uh, where uh, the rate of change of resistivity uh, is actually pretty dramatic. Uh, I'm highlighting them with my mouse. And uh, this model is going to be very helpful later when combining all of the data we collected. We also took some uh, disturbed specimens uh, from the field. Here I have some grain size distributions from S2 and S3. We tested them in the lab with after Berg limits. We uh, identified all low plasticity clays uh, within the area where the displacement uh, is taking place. 
And then we also performed some ultrasonic testing for the determination of PNS wave velocities all below the uh, critical failure surface we identified just to understand what the rock uh, that is below the mass that is moving uh, has to say. And so here we have uh, a total of eight um, specimens we tested. We have ABCD green schists and EFGH gray philitic schists. And all of them were taken uh, at a depth that is greater than 40 meters below the potential failure surface. This is all rocks that is uh, pretty intensely uh, chaotic. And, and, and this is a picture, it's a photograph of the complexity of the tectonic environment and the geology we have in these areas. So this is a further confirmation of this complexity here. Uh, all of the data, all of the results about shear wave velocity, P wave velocity, ratios between them for all of the specimens we took are described in the paper. I, um, I won't go through all of them, but I can tell you that the take home message is that there was a huge complexity. And then the final model of the Gimigliano landslide is here. Uh, this is a nice cross section superimposed to the 3D model. As you can see here, this is the cross section where S2 and S3 are located. Uh, we draw the uh, critical failure surface with the help of all of the data we collected. Uh, we also performed some tests uh, uh, using numerical models to confirm this shape. And this is the final model we superimposed with the electrical resistivity tomography data. And as you can see, the uh, combining all of the information we gathered tells us a very interesting story, which is those uh, areas of weakness we identified in the electrical resistivity tomography are pretty consistent with the geotechnical data, with the ultrasonic testing, and with the final uh, critical failure surface we identified going through that uh, thin phyllitic uh, schist layer that we uh, identified. So in conclusion, the combination of traditional and more modern test and monitoring techniques led to an enhanced characterization of these landslides. Uh, satellite data were used to guide prioritization of geotechnical investigation, as I believe we should do also in the future. Uh, we integrated laboratory and field tests uh, in a program that helped uh, the characterization of all of the materials involved in this phenomenon. And fortunately, we were able to combine geotechnical geophysical monitoring data to identify the location of a thin philitic unit that was responsible for slope instability phenomenon. The identification of these uh, critical failure surface is helping us out uh, to actually design um, uh, some uh, potential uh, measurements we can take, measures we can take to uh, avoid lens like the risk in the future. So this was a, you know, one case study, but through the lens of this case study, we are casting some light on how, when, uh, to combine different techniques and how to enhance the data we gather from each other. And so uh, we believe this is the present and the future to investigate and monitor complex landslides. And we really hope that all of the data we provided in the paper will be helpful for future studies. So this was my last slide. I want to thank you again. I hope we'll have a productive uh, question answer session later. Uh, here are, are, are our contact information if you wanna know any further details. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Zimero. We are perfectly in time. And I was particularly impressed by the accuracy of inclinometer measurements. But I know that there is a long tradition in your family about this kind of measurements. So thank you so much. And now is the time of the last presentation that will be delivered by Luca Comegna, a University uh, della Campania Luigi Van Vitelli. Uh, he will discuss about an old new question regarding the friction angle mobilized by Sholo Efto. Please, Luca. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your very nice uh, presentation. I am particularly pleased to present uh, this work prepared with Professor Luciano Picarelli and Gianfranco Urcioli that deals uh, with uh, earth flow in tectonite deposits. Uh, occurred in Italy that as known are widespread 
uh, first of all, along the Apennine chain. In particular, this table uh, shows some well documented cases, in particular, the main geometrical feature, for example, regarding the total length, uh, it could range typically from some hundreds of meters to more than three kilometers about the slope angle. Slope angle is usually particularly low and it could range uh, between eight and 12 degrees. But it's very also important to underline that the ratio between the total length and the depth of such landslides is uh, always very high. In particular, uh, some of these um, earth flows are featured by a, a, a depth of, a, of some, some meters, so are a few meters, so are very uh, uh, shallow, has uh, the one that is the object of our, our paper, the Masseria Marino Earth Flow, located in Basilicata region. Uh, upslope the alluvial plain of uh, the Basento, Basento River. Uh, its length is uh, about uh, 400 of meters, and in particular regarding the main track, the ground surface is inclined of about 10 degrees, and the mean thickness is um, about six uh, meters. Such earth flow is uh, active since more than 50 years and uh, its activity is essentially cyclic. During the first stage following uh, slope, uh, slope failure, the mass displays an essentially flow style with internal deformation that prevail over the displacement concentrated along the slipping surface. Regarding the rate of displacement, it could range between moderate to rapid. But after this stage, so uh, during the long term behavior of such hurt flow, the landslide body uh, displays uh, a, a typical slide style so featured by uh, the, the, the displacement, the total displacement is essentially the results of the meteoric strain concentrated within the shear zone and of course of slipping along the slip surface uh, that is within the shear zone, uh, in particular the uh, monitor the shear zone in the main track uh, is featured by thickness up to one meter thick, and the displacement rate is uh, usually very low, usually between extremely slow to slow, so some centimeters per, per year. Regarding uh, fabric, the parent uh, formation is constituted by hard clay shear lenses separated by fissures and major shear surfaces that are induced by tectonizing. Uh, within the, um, the soil volume are also present a number of rock fragments. The earth flow body is also uh, particularly uh, is more important deficient within the earth flow body, uh, but its clay matrix is softer than that of the parent formation due to the slope uh, deformation and to the mechanism of the of deterioration. Some rock fragments are also present, but it's also interesting to note that the shear zone located just um, uh, uh, under the earth flow body is uh, completely softened. In particular, uh, fissuring is not so evident at, at least at the mesoscale, and the clay particles are typically aligned along the major shear surface, as evidenced by some micro photo by macro photographs. A number of uh, field investigation and laboratory investigation, some of these results were also presented by. 
Paolo, Paolo Tommasi during his um, presentation revealed that uh, the shear zone is featured by the highest compressibility due to the more intense deviatoric strain induced by slope uh, movement and also by the lowest permeability in the direction normal to the, the landslide movement. Uh, so it also the shear zone, but an anisotropic hydraulic response so that the hydraulic conductivity parallel to the slope direction is higher than that measured along the normal uh, direction. Uh, coming to the long-term uh, behavior, such uh, long-term behavior is essentially governed by fluctuation of port water pressure along the slip uh, surface due to the large cumulative displacement, the mobilized friction angle is equal to the residual friction angle, uh, particularly regarding the results uh, carried out by some direct shear tests on, uh, on natural uh, specimens, we found uh, a uh, friction angle of about 11 degrees so that it is very close to the inclination of the ground surface and such result is also confirmed by the other by many other well documented cases again the residual friction angle is very close to the slope angle nevertheless if we make some classical back uh, analysis uh, to calculate the mobilized friction angle we don't uh, find the uh, measured residual friction angle. Uh, for, for instance, taking into account the hydrologic here, 1997, 1998, this uh, diagram shows, uh, for example, the water level measured within the earth flow body uh, by the piezometer P6 located in the main track. And also some information are reported about the, the displacement measured by topographic benchmark, this topographic uh, benchmark information also about the daily rainfall, but in this uh, diagram we report the uh, calculated friction, mobilized friction angle, and we could see that uh, just during the less active stages, so featured by the low values, the lowest values of the velocity, uh, we find that the, mobilized, the calculated mobilized friction angle is equal to such uh, low value. On the contrary, during the more active phases featured so by the higher uh, velocities, we could calculate a friction, mobilized friction angle that is about 18 degrees, so higher than the minimum values. There are different possible interpretations of such response of such difference. In, for example, in the literature, we find uh, some many, many works about uh, that invoke the viscous response along the slip surface so that the mobilized friction angle is probably a, a, a function of the displacement range rate in turn governed by fluctuation of water levels. At the same, at the same time, many authors um, report some consideration according to which uh, such increase on the friction angle is not so high. For example, Scampton in 1985 uh, reports that, uh, says that just a few percent. So for instance, considering in our case, an increase of about 10%, we could just calculate a value ranging between 12 and 13 degrees. So again, uh, far from the uh, maximum, the peak uh, calculated value. Uh, again, some uh, another possible explanation was given by other authors that invoke the non-linearity of the residual strength envelope. Uh, for example, Picarelli in 1991 reports the laboratory, the results of some laboratory tests 
regarding the Laviano clay shears that shows that the ratio between the shear stresses and the effect in normal stress tend to decrease with, uh, with the normal effective stresses. Uh, for instance, uh, in the literature, we find the equation proposed by Chattopadhyay in 1972. And just uh, using this expression, and uh, if we want to imagine, calculate that uh, along the slip surface, the difference between the maximum and the minimum effective stresses during the investigative period is about 40 kPa, we could just justify an increase to a peak, maximum peak of uh, 15 degrees. So again, uh, far from the calculated peak. According to us, uh, we could also evoke another possible explanation that tend to take into account that uh, the effective normal stresses along the slip surface are likely higher. And in order to understand such a response, we launched some uh, simple numerical analysis uh, uh, carried out uh, with the SIP code in order to simulate the hydrological response taking into account the uh, measured the differences in the hydraulic and mechanical properties evidenced by earth flow body shear zone and power information in particular that the shear zone is featured by a higher volume compressibility and the impermeability in the direction normal to the slope direction that is lower than the other two soils. So uh, we again taking into account uh, the hydrologic year 1997-1998, we assign the measured initial condition, just assign an initial position of the phreatic level. Uh, regarding the boundary condition, we assign along the ground surface the daily rainfall measured during the winter, the rainy the rainy season and uh, so the uh, we could say that uh, this is the results this blue line of our analysis uh, could give that uh, uh, the overlapping between the calculated value within the earth flow body and the measured piezometric value uh, are quite good so the model we assume that is quite uh, reliable. In the next slide, we want to show the evolution of the calculated piezometric level within the earth flow body, point P, and within the shear zone, point Q, that are very close and also the evolution of the local flow direction and the consequent calculated mobilized friction angle. As we can see, the uh, increase uh, in, of the piezometric level calculated within the earth flow body is faster than that calculated within the shear zone. In particular, regarding the local flow direction, such directions are nearly vertical within both the soils just during the, the, the first month, but during the long-term behavior, it tends to rotate just within the earth flow body, while remain nearly vertical within the shear surface that so this process of swelling, uh, the shear surface receives the water from the upper upper part. And so the uh, piezometric level, piezometric, calculated piezometric level within the shear zone are lower. So they justify higher effective normal stresses that as a consequence uh, justify lower calculated mobilized friction angle. It, the peak value, uh, it remains higher than the residual, measured residual value, but uh, it very, it's very next, so probably uh, invoking and uh, taking into account also viscous effects and also the non-linearity, uh, probably they allow a, a, a better agreement. So going to conclusion, we could say that the long-term activity of Masseria Marino Earth Flow is governed by pore water pressure fluctuation. 
mobilized friction angle calculated accounting for the measured piezometric levels within the earth flow body is higher than that measured in the laboratory. Viscous phenomena and nonlinearity of the residual strength envelope are not able alone to justify such difference, but thanks to some very simple numerical analysis, we could uh, say that uh, higher effective stresses along the slip surface are present and they allow to calculate a lower mobilized friction angle. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Luca. I would like only to say that the strength of your the, the research you summarized in your presentation is clearly shown through your slides and your presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I want to add that uh, after four presentation, we are only two minutes late. So thank you so much to all the lecturers. And now it's really a pleasure from my side to pass the microphone to Biliana Abolmasov, uh, who will govern the discussion. Please, Biliana. Thank you, Professor Crescini. I have to say that I'm very happy uh, because I'm convener of this session. And I have to say that I'm so sorry because we are not in apples, uh, enjoying in conference and enjoying in landscape and, and food, of course. So uh, I hope that uh, soon or, or very soon or maybe um, for few few months or, or a year we will be, uh, I, I hope that I will be in, in, uh, in your university uh, taking care about one PhD student. So uh, we have very good uh, for presentation. The first one was, uh, let's say, remember me of our Umka landslide and very deep and uh, interesting landslide in, in Mars. So I, after, the, I, um, after the four question from a uh, participant, I will ask something uh, Gospodin uh, Konstantinos. The second was uh, like everything in Russia, so big. So the, <laughs> the rock slide or rock block slide is uh, very impressive. Uh, and I hope that Daria will be um, will enjoy in, in our discussion. The third presentation was uh, very nice and very effective presentation of very good geotechnical investigation on the site. So uh, many of us will be enjoying in, in uh, um, something like this in, in our practice. And in the end, uh, the local Comenia presented the something which is, I'm not so familiar with that because I have not experienced it with the earth flows, only with the debris flow, it is, it is completely different story. So it will be uh, more question for, for, for Luca. So after the presentation, I have to ask the, the we have uh, four questions and I will uh, ask the participant to, to uh, to ask the presenter what they want. So please, um, uh, like Giuseppe is uh, technical yeah, yeah, support. We can start. So please, uh, please uh, uh, include the, the, the people who wants to ask the presenter. Yeah, yeah we, no, for the moving, there is uh, the technical, I cannot. Uh, yes, I can do it, uh, but I need to know which name. We, we have two extra questions. Uh, yes, we have extra questions from... Uh, six questions we have actually. I saw only four, so... <laughs> no, 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 I, I pressed the button answered live and they moved them somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> I have two uh, questions also. Okay. So shall we start with? Yeah, we can start. Good questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Me, reply first. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, okay, okay. I have a question about the, the discontinuities. Uh, obviously, they are asking about the slick insights, how we introduced them in our models. We used the Plaxis finite element mode, uh, code 
this code allows us to introduce uh, interfaces inside our model. When you add an interface, you have the ability to reduce the mechanical parameters as much as you wish along this interface. So we checked the drills, we saw where are the slick inside, and we designed them inside our cross section by using the interfaces. And then we took under consideration the geotechnical parameters that we took from the laboratory tests, and we set those uh, interfaces uh, in order to have uh, low mechanical parameters, as low as the uh, laboratory tests uh, were indicating. So that's how we introduced the slick insights, the interfaces in, uh, inside our model. That's my answer in that question. I hope uh, it's sufficient enough. And the second, uh, do you want something more about that? I would like to just ask, but not about the, the phases, about something other, okay? Okay. And the second question has to do with the insert data. Uh, the Roberto Vasallo asked me if I could give some more details about the horizontal and the vertical displacements. So in that case, I need to share my screen once more, if possible. Uh, here, you can see the, sorry, the horizontal displacements. Uh, and as you can see, the entire mass from the C8 slope over here until the, the feet of the let's slide moves towards the east, towards, uh, eastwards. And here we can see the vertical displacements. We can see that the, the lower part of the let's slide, this part over here, appears to uplift and the uh, Western part appears to subside. So we have a, a, a movement, a transitional uh, failure that the, the material uh, goes, uh, moves towards the east. If you, we, we can check those graphs, uh, the, I add them now in my presentation in order to be able to reply to that question. We can see that we can see the time series of the displacements. As you can see, we have these graphs here indicate the um, uh, horizontal displacements, and those here indicate the vertical displacements. So you can see the light slide moving. And after uh, 2017, we have you can see an increase in the speed of the light slide. Those are the horizontal displacement. So the entire mass moves towards the east. If we check the vertical displacements, we can see the green line indicating the displacements in area E here, the foot of the last slide. We can see the uplift. You can see it clearly see the uplift. If we check B, C, and D, B, C, and D, we can see the subsiding movements and the acceleration of the movements after 2017. Those data are coming from Sentinel uh, satellite data. I have to note that I took them from, from the study I mentioned before. I took those data from the NPA satellite mapping report. It's not my processing. I have to be clear on that. But I have added those lines here. And another interesting thing is that if you check the horizontal displacements, that you can see that the, the speed of the displacements increase during summer. That's why, that's because during summer, all those buildings located on top of the last slide uh, are activated because they usually uh, are uh, summer houses. So they start consuming water. They don't have a sewering system. So the water going down to the overhang aquifer increases and the groundwater level increases during the summer. So you can see that during the summer period, the large light actually speeds, uh, increase its uh, velocity. Uh, another interesting thing that you can notice that uh, uh, when we go to area B, 
area B is over the crest of the prehistoric landslide, you can see that this part is moving uh, much uh, uh, faster than the rest of the sliding mass, uh, polygons C and D. So uh, that has uh, to alert us in order to be uh, careful. I think this part is about to collapse according to those data. I don't know if uh, this was uh, sufficient enough for you. Yes, it, you was, it was very nice. Okay, thank you. Very nice, but uh, I, I have just a small comment, not a question. Uh, it is very interesting because uh, it was, uh, you said that it was prehistoric landslide. It is not usual reactivation of the whole body of the landslide. It is usual that you have the some movement inside the body, like, uh, you know, the smaller or, or let's say shallower uh, movement, but the movement of the whole landslide, prehistoric landslide body is extremely rare, <laughs> let's yes, say. Yes, because yes. of that, it's very, very interesting landslide, really. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you so much. The problem is that we, we constructed 500 houses of top of that landslide, so, I completely understand you. Uh, I had a similar one slide in my home <laughs> with uh, almost 500 houses <laughs> without civic system. The almost similar situation, marvelous hilarity. So, uh, thank you. Do you uh, is there any question related to to uh, to this landslide? No. I, I think. Could you please hear about that? Yes, I have one more question about okay. the model. Yes, I used the Plaxis, the Morkulob model, and I took, as I told you before, the parameters from the geotechnical studies available uh, for the last slide. I correlated them and I selected two sets of parameters, the lower values and the higher values. So I did some parametric simulations because when you have to deal in a so big large slide, you cannot uh, take one set of parameters and uh, be certain about the results. So I increased the groundwater level, reduced it, uh, I removed it. I did all possible combinations in order to be sure that uh, my simulations were uh, sufficient. And especially because in the such a big landslide, the groundwater level is not constant. It is probably isolated. And it is uh, calculation is let's say uh, very very rough <laughs> related to groundwater. Uh, thank you so much. Can Sorry. we move to 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 Daria and the Russian example? Okay, I'm sorry. Good. I have a very um, not stable internet connection, so I can't hear everything well. So if you have any question, I can answer. Uh, but it's preferable to see in them in written form. OK, may I, may I ask you uh, just a small question? Uh, it is about kinematic analysis. Because kinematic analysis is, uh, as by, per my opinion, is always related to, to uh, isolated case studies and not so uh, big deformation and big landslides. It is more local uh, on the cuts and the slope. Uh, how you detect the such big landslides, like uh, as you as you presented? Uh, okay, this landslide was detected uh, on the base of uh, first of all the uh, pictures, um, Sputnik images. images. Okay, from images. Uh, and then by the root observations mm -hmm. and uh, all the fracturing systems uh, characteristics were measured. And then the uh, diagram, uh, can I show it on the, on the slide? Let me, let me show you. This one, the stereogram with okay. all the structuring system characteristics were built. And then uh, the special analysis 
results that uh, the systems of fractures, they cross and form like a wedge type block. So uh, yes, the size of the landslide body is pretty big. As I have said, it's about uh, million, three million. Three million cubic meters. Cubic meters, yes. But uh, the analysis showed that it, 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 uh, it can be active in the form of the wedge. Mm -hmm. uh, but I suppose that you have uh, additional something, not just uh, um, discontinuities. I think that you have some faults probably. Yes, because yes. for such a big landslide, you need a, something like a fault. It is impossible just to, uh, you know, orientation of the of the discontinuity. It is not enough for something like this. Just it is my opinion. I yes. think that you have some big faults there. Maybe they are they are uh, let's say preparing whole whole area for the such a big landslide. Yes, you are right. There are some big fault systems and some uh, small uh, faults were found on the site, on the landslide site. It's blocky, probably, yeah? Yes, it's a complex, complex landslide. Complex and blocky, yes. Mm -hmm. and complex uh, and blocky. It all uh, was accounted in the analysis. Is there any question additionally to, to Daria, please? Suppose no. Okay. Daria, thank you for your presentation and for your answer. Thank you very much. Спасибо. <laughs> the third presentation. Um, excellent site investigation. Excellent conclusion. Uh, do you have any question to Paolo Timaro? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I think I saw a couple of uh, questions and I tried to put together a couple Please. of slides to explain, you know, some of these. These are both excellent questions, by the way. So the first question was by uh, Professor Lucioli about the piezometric readings. And so um, we essentially had dry piezometers at S1, which was the, uh, the boring located in a transitional zone between the uh, between the uh, medieval village and the uh, active area where the Gimigliano landslide takes place. So uh, I think that there's, that is just a photograph of the complexity of the geology and the tectonic environment in the area. Uh, while for S2 and S3, we do have some piezometer readings. So if we take a look to S2, we can see that uh, we have at around 26 meters, a gray field is a uh, thin layer uh, that we thought may be responsible uh, as a uh, hydraulic conductivity discontinuity of some uh, water table. And in fact, what we see here in S2 is that above uh, 15 meters, uh, more or less, we have, um, you know, this water table that is pretty persistent. Uh, besides the first couple of, um, of measurements, it's pretty persistent throughout the, the years. Uh, a similar feature was observed in um, S3, where um, we have kind of a persistent water table measured at around 20 meters. For boring S3, by the way, which is located on the same cross section as S2, we couldn't find any thin layer responsible for, you know, a capping or, you know, a hydraulic conductivity discontinuity, but probably we may have missed it in the boring log since we're talking about very, very thin layers, usually sub one meter of this material. And this is kind of a, you know, related to the fact that we have a lot of foldings um, and um, a lot of um, brittle and uh, non-brittle deformations taking place in these uh, materials. And so uh, there, there's a very chaotic distribution of layers 
we couldn't even find the continuity, lateral continuity between S2 and F S3 along the same cross sections. There were some, uh, some layers that were disappearing in one boring and appearing again in another boring. So uh, I think that these piezometric conditions and these uh, water table conditions are kind of a photograph of that uh, high complexity. I should mention that we did do some uh, numerical studies and we performed some parametric studies and the location of the water table. It does have an impact, of course, but the most important uh, feature uh, from the numerical studies is that the location uh, of the critical failure surface, its thickness and its friction angle are the driving factors. So even though we have some uncertainties about water table, uh, we believe that we, we got the model right uh, because you know this is kind of corroborated by, by some parametric studies. As I said, um, and, and Professor Abolmasov uh, underlined that we have, I think, a very precious set of data here uh, because we had the chance to really dive deep into the details of this complex landslide. And we were able to actually use a limited number of geotechnical characterization data points, only for borings, uh, but we kind of enhance those uh, data points by using geophysical uh, investigation, satellite radar data. And so kind of the picture uh, came together, I think in a nice manner. Uh, may, may I just? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, we just add something bit, uh, before the second uh, answer because uh, uh, limited data, uh, much better model. <laughs> because if you have so much data, it's not easy to modeling the, the line slide. That's the practice. Uh, I have to say uh, we have very similar, very big and very complex landslide during the highway construction. Uh, it is uh, Palazoic sheets, very similar to, to uh, your, your lithostratigraphic units. Uh, for example, the piezometric level five meters uh, you know, below the, 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 the slope, it was, uh, let's say, uh, two meters before surface and uh, 15 meters uh, uh, longer, you know, it was 20 meters. It is almost impossible to model the hydraulic regime in, the, in that situation, especially in filitas and sheets and, and that uh, very, um, let's say, uh, mix of geology. It's not easy because it is the probably uh, many local faults uh, in the in the deep, and it is not easy to reconstruct the completely geology. That's that's the my point. And, Thank you. And this is this is so true. Thank you so much, actually, for this highlight because the follow up question was about the interpretation of the electrical resistivity tomography. So I'm gonna go with that. By the way, we did it, we did we decide not to show the numerical model on purpose because you know I, we thought that the most important and impactful feature of this study is the comprehensive geotechnical, geophysical, structural monitoring data we put together, which we think can be informative for other studies in similar uh, complex uh, geology and tectonic environments. Now to go through what you just said, you know, uh, uh, you anticipated what I wanted to say. We have, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, uh, a very complex tectonic. We have primary faults, we have secondary splays all around the area, actually crossing the town of Gimigliano. So if we look at the gradient of resistivity in the electrical resistivity tomography, we could identify at yeah. least five fault discontinuities in this particular cross section, not to mention all of the other sections we analyzed. And, and we didn't do the resistivity study, but we tried to interpret them uh, by using the geotechnical data and the geophysical data. So as you can see here, you have sub-vertical gradients, uh, sub-vertical discontinuities. And these are clearly the features that we were describing by looking at the structural analysis by geologists. These are primary and secondary splays of that uh, strike slip fault that goes all around and crosses the entire town. So we believe that this has a strong influence on the complexity of the geology. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we can kind of see these from one cross section, but I assure you, you can see the same kind of features in all of the cross sections. 
And then, so this is for the vertical features. For horizontal feature, we believe that the rapid change in resistivity gradient, and this is the answer for uh, Dr. Tagarelli, which, uh, who was asking about the interpretation of these. Uh, we believe that horizontally, we do have some weakness planes uh, that I can show you mainly uh, here. So there is a rapid transition between low resistivity and high resistivity. We believe this is kind of an evidence of that weaknesses that is go, you know, goes right through the critical failure surface we identified using kilometer data. And then the yeah. same thing occurs up above going all the way through and passing through S2. Now I should mention that even though this is a very nice reconstruction, it seems to provide us with a nice photograph of what's happening, the cross section of the electrical resistivity tomography is not exactly co-located with the cross section that we have from S2 and S3. So there may be some lateral discontinuity, uh, which may explain uh, some features that we observe in these interpretation that are not present uh, when just analyzing the geotechnical data. So uh, that being said, we believe that we can see at least a couple of weakness planes uh, in the horizontal interpretation of gradient of, of resistivity, which should be related uh, with yeah. the critical pillar surface. Uh, Paolo, let's, let's add something more. Uh, if you are testing yourself, your, your knowledge in the practice, uh, it is very clear, clear that you have to find sliding surface and to divide what is moving, what is not moving. So uh, the, the point of, the, of the, your presentation, uh, your characterization of landslides is uh, just, just to find and uh, critical failure surface and to find what is moving, what is not in that uh, very complex geological situation. So I think that, that your work was very, very, uh, you know, dedicated, and I think the presentation was so good. And I could uh, show yourself the my line slides. I'd be <laughs> very, happy to. Very similar <laughs> with, with three thousand meters of of drilling. Wow. After five years, they found finally the deepest sliding surface, and it was you know the fight between the the, the supervision and the contractor and and everybody you can you could imagine. So thank you so much. Do, you, do you so much. any additional uh, question to Paula? Do we have? No, thank you. And on the end, something which is uh, not so, um, I'm not so uh, familiar, but Luca will help to me <laughs> with earth flows. So uh, I, um, I saw several debris flow in my life but earth flows not so much. So could you, uh, I, of course it is the very, very well uh, documented and very well reviewed uh, the, the whole the story with earth, earth slide. So please, and earth flow. For me is a question always is very strange how to move from solid mechanics to, to fluid mechanics. So I think it, it's not easy and how to connect classical geotechnical parameters with uh, fluids. So uh, please answer on the, on the, of the question first, and after that we could discuss. Yes, uh, the, the, the analysis are essentially uh, the, a sort of re simulation of a, a swelling process, and we assign to the materials uh, as also is possible with the, the zip code, uh, not only the hydraulic parameters, so of course uh, permeability and also differences in, in direction, but also the volume, volumetric compressibility. Mm -hmm. So the increase or decrease of uh, the pore water pressure, if we think that the total stresses remain, of course, uh, not uh, remain constant, of course, it induces also a, a variation in the effective uh, stresses. If we want uh, to take into account the more rapid stages, more rapid stages, 
during the first period, so just after failure, so after a sort of retrogressive mechanism that starts as a rotational slide and then the mass tend to move along the, the main track. Of course, we have to take into account another, another model. We also uh, take into account uh, the some other, other, other model just also to reproduce uh, unrated effect during such such movement but uh, we now are stressing the um, the period of the, the long term behavior very slow uh, very uh, controlled strongly controlled by uh, or fluctuation of power water pressure so what we want to understand uh, and we, what we want to also uh, highlight it, it is that uh, very frequently in this kind of numerical analysis uh, the properties of shear zone are neglected mm -hmm. are neglected so typical we have the hurt flow body the lens light body and then the stable parent formation and then the slip uh, and then slip yeah. surface in fact, uh, also reconnected to, to an observation of Professor Marinos, it's uh, very frequently necessary to assign higher conductivity to the, uh, to the lens light body in order to simulate that, uh, that uh, the piezometric level measured. Well, yes. On the opposite, if we take into account what we measured, what we measured uh, that uh, in the normal direction, Mm -hmm. Such permeability of another solid because the shear zone is completely different yes. if compared to the lens light body due to more intense deviatoric strain and also stresses. So, this uh, lower hydraulic conductivity uh, tends to uh, justify also lower fluctuation along the slip surfaces mm -hmm. and so just to likely justify higher uh, effective stresses. Of course, someone could say, but uh, why don't we uh, measure the pore water pressure within the shared zone? Uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult during yeah, the active stages, of course, because it's very next mm -hmm. to the slippery surfaces. But that measured pore water pressure in the earth flow body were again very next to the slip surface, but just above the, the shared yeah. zone. Yeah. So, I hope that... Uh, yeah, it is interesting because you are talking about uh, sliding surface or shear zone. Uh, you know, in generally, the, the, uh, the difference between flows and, and slides is uh, shear zone. <laughs> yes, yeah. because flows is flowing without typical shear zone. So because of that, I ask. In, in fact, during this long-term behavior, the hurt to flow behave essential, essentially like slide like slide, of course, with higher internal deformation, but including this very, very uh, slow movement, uh, usually. I read that there is another question mm -hmm. from Paolo Ruggeri. Have yeah. you considered the possible contribution offered by the friction at, do, at the two sides of the lens light channel? Thanks for your... Uh, for your question, of course, uh, the, the, the answer is, is yes. And in particular, in our paper, we also dedicated uh, a, a, a small part that we tried, it's very difficult, of course, to simulate a 3D uh, model. We tried just uh, uh, making very easy hypothesis because we have to consider the vertical sides. So we have also to imagine the normal effective stress. So more or less the, the horizontal effective stress. So we have to imagine also a, an earth pressure coefficient. And we uh, make this, uh, this hypothesis. Uh, and of course, we calculate, just uh, thanks to this very simple model, we calculate lower friction angle. But uh, the lower value and also the upper value are lower. So the range is not more 11 degrees, 18 degrees, but now the range is 9 degrees, 17 degrees. So not so uh, much, uh, much far. So the problem remains. The problem remains because this, this fluctuation uh, 
regulated by piezometric level, it's not possible to justify simply invoking a 3D model. So yeah. I agree with Paolo and I thank him because of course the, the calculated value should be lower, but the problem remains. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Do we have any question for Luca, please? Can we conclude, Professor Costini? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Biliana. Uh, we have uh, we had a very interesting session, full presentation, a long discussion. And we have uh, only a delay of six, seven minutes. So we are yeah. perfectly in time. And uh, I want once again to thank uh, Lupasakis, Shubina, Zimmero, Komenya, and of course, Biliana Bolmasov, hoping what you said that uh, in a short time, we will see all together in presence. So thank you yeah. very much to all of you. Thank you for your very nice presentation for the discussion. Have a good luck for the next month. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.